right. Aurora. Okay, am I on now? Let's see. Okay, I'm on now, right? Yes. Okay, very good. We'll start um, with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, once again, we are grateful that we can come and learn more of you. Help us to have attentive hearts and minds so we can know you even better. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 First Corinthians 12, 4 says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. We are going to be talking about spiritual gifts. Now, this has been a series that I've been doing. I don't know if you've been really realizing that, but this is a fundamental belief, number 17, Seventh-day Adventist belief on spiritual gifts. Last week, we did the Ten Commandments, we did the Sabbath, and always try to bring in some things that maybe are might be a little bit new to you, um, I don't always point that out, but like last week, for example, I talked about Colossians. And most people believe that Colossians is talking about the ceremonial law. And that that's that says, you know, don't let anyone judge you about festivals and Sabbaths. And that brought out a completely different point of view. Now, if you want to learn what that point of view is, again, you'll have to go back and see the video. <laughs> but uh, I feel it's more... Uh, more in keeping with the context, and really, and I used some uh, scholarship to, to show that that was the case as well. So we've done that, we've done the remnant, we've done um, uh, forces of good and evil, so we've done a, a bunch of these fundamental beliefs, and we're going to be doing some more as well. So we're going to continue with spiritual gifts at this time. I'd like to start with something funny, though. It's a story about Albert Einstein, a true story. Apparently, when Albert was a little boy, he had, he just simply wouldn't talk. He didn't talk, his parents were quite concerned about that. And then one day, out of the blue, he says, the soup is too hot. And the parents are like really so happy, they say, Son, why haven't you talked until now? And Albert replied, because up to now, everything was in order. <laughs> you could see a little genius saying something like that, huh? Now, not everybody, of course, is Albert Einstein and is a genius. But we don't have to be to be used by God. God uses ordinary people. He uses common people. And as I said, I'd like to talk about this spiritual gifts, and this is what our fundamental belief says about it. It says, God bestows upon all members of his church in every age spiritual gifts that each member is to employ in loving ministry for the common good of the church and for humanity. Given by the agency of the Holy Spirit, who apportions to each member as he wills, the gifts provide all abilities and ministries needed by the church to fulfill its divinely ordained functions. Now, most of us probably know that every person is precious in God's sight. As a matter of fact, we believe that Jesus would have died for how many? Just one. He would have died, given his life for just one. And what does that mean? It means that Every person is important. Why? Because we were created in God's image, because God loves us, and he has a plan for each one of us. It doesn't matter if you're the panhandler on the street or the president of the United States. In God's eyes, you're precious, important, and God has a plan for each one of you. And so that's a wonderful thing that the Bible teaches. And when you look at the Bible, and you read the stories of the Bible, you realize that God used very ordinary people. He used, for an example, Joseph. You remember he was sold into slavery, and then he became the ruler over all of Egypt. He became the savior of the world, and he gave the world the bread of life. Or you have Gideon. 
Gideon was a very shy man, and yet God used him to uh, do a very special work, and he saved his people with just 300 people against a multitude of an army. You have Deborah, that's found in the book of Judges, where she's a woman, and yet God made her a judge. The judges were all saviors, they were all liberators, and he made her a liberator of God's people. So God uses people to his honor and glory if you make yourself available, right? And so what God does is he gives these Christians endowments. We call these endowments spiritual gifts that God uses to do his work and to do his bidding. I remember a long time ago, I was asked to go and speak in a nursing home. Now, I had never done any public speaking before, and so I was quite you know, nervous about it. I hadn't talked before in front of anyone, but I wanted to share Jesus. They had invited me to do so, and I wanted to give them a message of hope and so forth and so on, just a uh, short devotional. And what was so interesting was I got up to speak, and all of a sudden, I felt as if something came over me, like some type of, like, I don't know, energy or power. Well, later I figured out it's the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. But yeah. came over, and all of a sudden, it's as if I was a trained speaker, and I knew what I was going to say. I did it with enthusiasm, and I realized it was the Lord using me. And my point is this, is when God, when you are asked of God to do something, God will empower you with his spirit to be able to do it. Amen. And so you just need to go forward and God does that for us. You know, God used Mary there, just a peasant woman, and said, you know, you've been highly favored and she became the, uh, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. This young lady, when she was just a teenager, God came to her and said, make known to others what I have revealed to you. And that was Ellen White. What a blessing she has been to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. God uses people, ordinary people. You know, it was Abraham Lincoln who said, God must love common people. Because he made so many of them. And that's true, isn't it? God loves ordinary and common people. Spiritual gifts. It says in Ephesians 4.11, God gave gifts to people. He made some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to go and tell the good news, and some to have the work of caring for and teaching God's people. Ephesians 4.11. So these spiritual gifts so we can reach out to others. We can bring people in, the Great Commission, to bring them in, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to minister to the church. That's why God gave the gifts. In Romans 12, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. But it begins like this. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. But rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So what he's saying is here, these gifts are not to puff us up. It's not to make us better than somebody else. We're all one in Christ, aren't we? Yeah. Male or female, we're all one in Christ. And he says these are not to make you better than anybody else, but it's so that you can be able to be effective for the Lord. And so then he talks about some of the gifts that God uses. For each, he says, for, e for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, from one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And so he uses the analogy of the body to talk about what we are as a church body together. And that's what he brings out. He brings that out again in Ephesians 4.4. 4. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. So the body all works together. And if it doesn't, of course, there's a big problem with the body. 
So God uses all of us, all of us within that body, in order to accomplish his will. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says this, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied graces. Grace. So all these spiritual gifts are for us to be able to minister to everybody else. 1 Corinthians 12, once again, talks about the spiritual gifts. It says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. God wants us to understand. He wants us to understand what these spiritual gifts are all about. It says, Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there's given, through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, a message of wisdom. We're going to be talking about the different gifts in a little while here. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. This is not like a faith to believe in Jesus. This is like faith to be able to do great things for God. And to another, gifts of healing by one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues or languages. And still to another, interpretation of languages. I have this gift, the gift of languages. Hola, como estas? Some of you have that gift as well, right? All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So he gives all these different gifts. Look at them. You have Romans, 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter. You have the gift of prophecy. That's the gift of being able to um, uh, look, you know, understand the future by the working of the Holy Spirit. Also, the gift of prophecy, and for example, in Corinthians, is actually the gift of teaching. That is also considered the gift of prophecy. Serving. That's a wonderful gift given by the Holy Spirit. Teaching, exhorting, that's encouraging others. Giving, imagine having the gift of giving. Leadership, mercy. Then you have the gifts of, like the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. This is where people are very perceptive and understand um, uh, maybe in a way that nor the average person doesn't. The gift of faith. You might have heard of George Mueller, who had this wonderful gift that he trusted God, believed in him, had an orphanage of thousands of children, and he never asked anybody for a dollar, and yet he was able to do great things. He had the gift of faith, gifts of healings. Even though these gifts might not seem as prominent today, they're still available. God still does healings. We lay hands on people, and he does it according to his will, of course. Miracles and prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, the gift of tongues or languages, interpretation of tongues. And then you have these gifts that are gifts that have to do with, with teaching gifts, like apostle. Those are people like the 12 apostles who went out. Prophets, like for an example, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. We believe that uh, Ellen White was a prophetess of the Lord, even though she wasn't uh, writing the Bible type prophet. We have the gift teachers. We need those. Helps, administration. All these gifts are given so that the church would run, so that the church would run e efficiently, and that the gospel would go forth along the way. Here are another um, idea of the, of the gifts that uh, we've just gone over. Now here are seven gifts of the Spirit that God gives to anyone. For an example, the gift of wisdom. Remember in the book of James, what does it say? If you lack wisdom, what should you do? Ask, ask. ask of God and he'll give you that. Gift of knowledge, you get that by reading the scriptures, being well informed, reading other books. The gift of counsel, where you're able to um, give people Good counsel. I've known people like that. I knew a woman in my other church. She was just such a wise woman that whenever there was a problem, I would send her. I would send to her and I'd say, hey, could you talk with this 
young woman that could explain things to her. She was wonderful. I, I said, you know, I want you to be one of the elders. No, not interested. I'm willing to do this for you, Pastor. You know? uh, fortitude, that's the gift of, of staying on, understanding piety, the fear of the Lord, having that reverence, that respect for God. These are gifts that God gives to each and every one who wants them. There's some wonderful gifts, the gifts of, uh, for an example, the gift of cooking and baking. You know, um, it was Ellen White who said that that gift is worth 10 talents. <laughs> Have you ever had good, good, good food like my mother used to make? That's 10 talents. Or the gift of helps. What a wonderful <laughs> gift that is. And we know we have people in this church who have that beautiful gift of wanting to help others, blessing others along the way. That's a beautiful gift. The gift of hospitality. You have people like that, that they open up their doors to others. I think I told you of this lady who was a Jehovah's Witness when I was tree planting, she would have 25, 30 of us kids, we were all Adventists in the Jehovah's Witness house. And she would have popcorn for us, she'd have all kinds of things, wonderful. Never forgot that lady, even though that was very, very long time ago. The gift of hospitality and the gift of giving. God gives people money, large amounts of money, so they can use that money to spread the gospel all along the way. You might have heard of this guy. He's the guy who made the alligator shirts. You know, the, what do they call those shirts? Oh, um, the the Isa. Crop? Crop? Yeah, those shirts. Anyway, the way he, he did that was he was in China. Yeah, who was it? Lacrosse. Yeah, Lacrosse, Lacrosse, yeah, right. He was in China. And he had this idea of making these shirts and putting a little alligator thing on it. And then he decided that he'd get his neighbors to do it too. And then he got more and more ladies, more and more and more and more and more, until he had a whole company of ladies making these shirts. He became a very, very rich man. And he used his riches to spread the good news of the gospel. The science building at Pacific Union College uh, was donated by him and many of our other institutions as well. The gift of giving, God gives people money and if you give, if you use the little bit you have and give to others generously, then God entrusts more to you. But the uh, Bible says there's one body and one spirit. So here's the analogy of the body. You know, the analogy of the body is this. Every part of the body is important, right? How many of you would like to be without fingers or toes? I remember I was doing some chaplaincy work in Loma Linda, and I went into a room, and they had just cut another toe off this young lady. She was about 30 years of age. And I told her, what's happening? She had diabetes. And I said, what's happening? And I don't think I'll ever forget it. She said, oh, I passed her. I love Kit Kats. <laughs> Chocolate bars. <laughs> I love Kit Kats. And little by little, they were cutting off her toes, you know. Her vision was completely gone. The body, we need every part of it, right? And the same is true in the church. Every part, every member of the church is important. We need everyone. And, and so that's why the analogy of the body is given. <clears throat> Jesus told this parable, the parable of the talents. And with this parable, what Jesus is teaching is this. God gives us talents but we don't have to use them. It's our choice, right? Yeah. But if we don't use the talents, we lose the talents. Mm -hmm. I knew this young girl, she was a wonderful singer, beautiful voice, almost professional level. 
and she simply stopped singing for whatever reason. She got tired, she stopped singing. And then when she started to try to sing again, the voice was not the same. You use it or you can lose it. So notice what it says here. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Then it says, he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he would receive two, gain two more also. So talents was, we think of talents as like gifts, but actually talents was money. So one talent was 67 pounds wow. of either silver or gold. Wow. So even one talent is a lot, 67 pounds pounds is a lot of silver and now um, one got two talents and somebody got even five talents along the way so then the master had wanted them to invest this and make more money but you know the story one of the men decided that he would not steal the money but that he would bury it in the ground and keep it safe for the master the master comes he talks to each one and he says, so tell me, I'm, I want an account of how you're doing. And so the man who had uh, five talents, he says, you know what, master, I invested it, I worked it out, and now I have five more talents for you. Oh, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. You've been faithful over that which is least, I will make you a ruler over that which is much. Then he said to the man with the two talents, he said, so what, what have you done? He says, Master, I worked hard. I took the two talents, two more talents. Oh, he said, oh, praise God. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over that which is little. Now I will make you a ruler over that which is much. Enter into the joy of your master, into the joy of the Lord. And he went to the one with one talent. And this is what he said. Lord, master, I knew you to be a hard man. Imagine saying that to your boss. I knew you're a tough boss. Reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. And the master said, you wicked, lazy servant replied the master. You knew that I reap where I have not sowed. You, you know I gather where I have not scattered. See, why didn't you give my money to the bankers? At least I would have gotten some interest on it. And then he said, take away his one talent and give it to the one who has five. And now ten. Because, and here's the point, for everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now that seems a little harsh, doesn't it? Our mild-mannered Jesus saying this, but it really is true to life, isn't it? That when you're willing to use your talents, your gifts, you receive more. At work, you work hard, what does the boss do? Gives you more work, more responsibility, right? He says, you know, I know you used to do just this, now I'm giving you more responsibility, oh boy, oh boy. But the person who is the lazy worker at the hospital, Carlos, what happens to that person? Bye-bye, they get fired. That's the way life is. And even in the kingdom of God, God wants us to be faithful stewards of that which belongs to him. He wants us to use our talents for the Lord. And you know, I want to talk to you just a little bit about an issue that has come upon us that you might not be aware of. You've probably heard of baby boomers, haven't you? Now, the baby boomers were people who were born from 1946 yeah. yep. to 
1964. <coughs> now they called them baby boomers because this was a very large generation. This was the generation after World War II. And after the, they came back from war, they had lots of babies. And these babies were the baby boomers. And these baby boomers ended up being the movers and the shakers of society. And they still have control over just about everything. But here's the problem. They're getting old. Somebody has to take their place. And so the next group, they, they're called millennials. These millennials are born from 1981 to 1996. Now the interesting thing about the millennials and the next group called Generation X is that they get married much later and they have less kids. They get married later and they just simply don't have that many kids like the boomers did. I mean, my wife came from a home where there were 13 kids. 13 of them. <laughs> it was a whole village there, but even in Mexico, they're not doing that hardly anymore. So then there's this modern generation, the kids of the millennials and Generation X, they're called Generation Z, 1997 to 2012. Do we have any Generation Zs here? We do? <laughs> Generation Z. <laughs> who, who? Dina, Dina's Generation Z. All right, good for you. Here's the interesting part, is that not that many of them, very few of them. See, when I studied to be a minister, for every position to be a pastor, there were 50 applications, 50 of them. When people wanted to come to Southeastern California Conference, they told me that they had this many applications. And from those applications, they just picked a few of them. It was hard. Not that way anymore, Eddie. They are like, please come be a pastor. And that's what it's going to be like for this next generation. There's going to be availability as far as all kinds of possibilities, chaplains, speakers, teachers, doctors, all of that is gonna be available because there's gonna just simply be less of everything and therefore a greater need is going to be shown. You know, people have said to me this, you know, pastor, I don't know what my gift is. Probably in the church, I'm just a hair or a little clump of hair, that's all I am. And I'm there like, you don't know what a little hair means. <laughs> hair is important. All of us are important in the kingdom of God. Think of Gideon. G uh, the angel of the Lord called him a man of valor. But when he called him this, he was hiding in a dungeon under the ground. He was scared for his life. And the Lord said, mighty man of valor why was he a mighty man of valor because god made him that not because he was already that and so god when god calls you to work for him god can make you what he wants you to be when i first was studying to be a pastor they told us that we would have to speak for 30 35 40 minutes i thought 35 40 minutes who in the world can talk that long you know, but after a while, you can talk that long, you know. God gives you the ability to do his work for him. Whatever he calls you to do, if you're willing, God will make it possible through his spirit to be able to do so. You know, the oak tree was just a little tiny acorn, but it became a mighty oak tree. Sometimes it takes a long time to develop, but if you're willing, God will develop you into a very uh, mighty and great thing. I, I love to think about Jose Rojas. He was one of my classmates 
Some of you know him. Do you know from Jose Rojas? Yes. He has the, the mustache that goes all the way to here. So we studied at school together. And I remember walking with Jose and Jose saying to me, one day I'm gonna reach 10,000 people, more, 100,000 people for Christ. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I don't say this to him, I'm saying, but Jose, you can barely make it out of college. You're failing your classes. You can hardly make it through school. You know, how are you gonna reach 100,000? But you know, he's done it. He's reached a lot more than 100,000 because he was willing, because he was willing to be used by God. God used him in a mighty, mighty way. And believe me, he has gotten master's degrees, honorary PhDs, because God can take any person who's willing to be used of him and do great and wonderful things for him. You might wonder, well, what is my spiritual gift? You know, you can take a spiritual gift inventory online. You answer these questions, maybe 10, 15 questions. So it takes about 15 minutes to do. And it'll tell you what your spiritual gift is. So if you're wondering, I'm not sure what my gift is, go online, and that's an easy way to find out. Now, many people, when they have gifts, they want to be the biggest and the best, like the disciples. All the disciples wanted to be what? Who is going to be numero uno, number one? They want to be the greatest. They want to call the shots. They want to, they want to be the movers and the shakers all the time. And I think of the story of Democles. Anybody ever heard of this story, Democles? Well, it's a story about a guy named Democles, and the king at that time was named Dionysus. And Democles said, you know, I wish I was king. I mean, I'm just here in the court, I'm just a, a pawn. I wish I was king. Look, look at the luxuries around you. Look, you have people serving you. You're the king, you sit on the throne. Wow, I'd love to be number one. I'd love to be the greatest. I want to be the king. And the king said, hey, well, why don't we trade places? I'll be in the court, and you can be the king. And he said, when do we start? Tomorrow. We start tomorrow. So he, he was ready. He came the next day, and he had to sit on the throne. And when he sat on the throne, he noticed that above the throne was a sword hanging from one horse hair. And when he saw that, he pleaded with Dionysus, please, you be on the throne. I'd rather be in the court. What does that mean? With great responsibility, with great power comes great responsibility. And with great responsibility comes great peril. People like being number one, but then you have criticism, you have this, you have that. You have to be able to take all of that with it. And that's what this story really teaches. It's better to bloom where you're planted, right? To accept what God has given you. If he's given you a position, he's asked you to do something, whatever it is, that's fine. But don't push your way forward. I, I know that this church doesn't have that problem. Some churches do. I know our church doesn't here. But anyway, it's a good warning for all of us, right? Don't push your way into positions. Trust the Lord. God will put you there if that's where you need to be. Amen. Notice where it says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 328. The special gifts of the Spirit are not the only talents represented in the parable, the parable of the talents. It includes all gifts and endowments, whether original or acquired, natural or spiritual, all are to be employed in Christ's service. I want to tell you the story of um, a guy who was first day at the university. His name was uh, David. And the professor said, look, find someone you don't know and say hello to this person. You know, let's make this a community. Say hello. Find someone you don't know. And just then, someone tapped this guy on the, on the shoulders. He turned around. 
and there was this woman and she says my name is Rose I'm 84 years old and I'm wondering can I have a hug oh I'll skip that story can I have a hug and he this lady Rose had a wonderful love of God and a wonderful spirit about her. And she went to the university and she was, she wanted an education. And so the guy says, of course you can. And he gave her a big hug and he says, so tell me, why are you here at such a tender age? And this is what she says. She says, well, I'm here to find a rich man, get married, have a couple of children, then retire and travel. No, seriously, he said, why did you come to the university? She said, I always dreamed of having a college education, and now, by God's grace, I'm going to get one. And she did. And she got her education. And she was a wonderful inspiration in that university, not only uh, because of her age, but for the Lord as well. I'd like to tell you one more story. This is a woman who, this woman here, a 105-year-old woman, graduates from Stanford University 83 years after leaving campus. 105. Can you be used of God? Do you have... You, do you have to say, I'm old, they can't be used anymore? I'm too young, I can't be used anymore? No, God can use anybody Amen. who's willing to be used by Him. There's opportunities for everyone everywhere. In the church and in society, we can bless others. We can use the gifts, talents that God gives us to His honor and glory. Do you believe that? Amen, amen and amen. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you so much for the gifts that you've given us through your Holy Spirit. You've given these gifts so that the church would be empowered to preach the gospel and to do all the many things that we do as a church. Not just preaching, not just teaching. The people who, Lord, are in the kitchen making the food, that's so important. The deacons and deaconesses, the AV people, our young people who help us with that. Those people who just come here and give hugs and smiles. The piano, the musicians. Oh Lord, we need them all. And I want to thank you for all of them, for bringing them here to this church. Continue to use us to your honor and glory as we ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is... Far and near, the fields are teeming. I don't know what, what page is